Well, hello there, brothers and sisters, and a very warm welcome to the Keys of the Kingdom Holy Bible YouTube channel. My name is Christopher Sparks, and I'm the translator of the Keys of the Kingdom Holy Bible. This is the red and gold hardback edition, published two years ago by Filament Publishing, and it is currently reprinting in a new leatherette edition, and I'm told by the publisher it will look just like this. And apparently the delivery date is May the 14th, and it should be on the website very, very soon. Praise the Lord God. Now, I made this video last night, and then when I started uploading it, it was very slow. And even in the middle of the night when I woke up briefly, I checked on my phone and it still hadn't uploaded. So there must have been a glitch in it. So I've got to do it again. But never mind, the will of the Lord, your will be done. And so, first though, thank you so much to the patrons of this channel. I'm so, so grateful to you. And thank you so much to all subscribers and the wonderful comments that you make. And as I always say, your wonderful comments create a wall of fire against trolls who would be made to look foolish. Right, part three. Where did it all go wrong in the churches? We're looking at the roots. So, what is exactly is it that is wrong? Wrong? Rang? In the Psalms in Scots, Psalm 5 verse 4, For you are nay God while likes the rang. So, if he's nay God while likes the rang, we had better know exactly what is rang and that he doesn't like, and we also better know what is right that our Lord God and Saviour does like. Now, ever since Eden, man has had an inclination away from God's commandments and an attraction towards his own ideas he's made up to satisfy his lusts and imagination. Part 1, we looked at the Latin Vulgate mistranslation and the so-called Church Fathers' creeds. Part 2, we looked at the Reformers, Reformed Theology, and they're stamping down the codes of orthodoxy by which they could build their religious empire, having sacked the Pope and now instituting their own worldly rule in the kingdom of men and outlawing any rival voice with license from their mates and goons in Parliament. The consequence, true Bible teaching was in effect made illegal by the Reformers. By the codes of orthodoxy in the 39 articles, they, through their goons, laid down who may have office functions and who may not. Anybody assu assuming to preach the word of God without their license, that is, if, say, a carpenter, for example, wanted to explain the gospel of the kingdom to a private group of, let's say, 12, he was liable to persecution, prosecution and prison. Article 26 of the 39 articles we saw in its um, heading, the unworthiness of ministers, it goes so far, so far as to say, though they be ministered by evil men. That's what it says, evil men. We may use their ministry in hearing the word of God. Sorry? Evil men. We may use their ministry in hearing the word of God. I didn't think evil men <laughs> knew the word of God, did they? Whenever did that happen? The men who wrote these things were themselves those evil men. And the carpenter, who might want to tell the gospel of the kingdom to a private meeting, he is the one acting lawfully, and those who would prosecute, persecute and imprison those who were acting 
unlawfully against were, were the ones who were acting unlawfully against the law of God, divine law. So what's the connection with what's wrong in the churches? Well, we need to understand you cannot institutionalize the word of God. Paul says the word of God is not chained. Those who institutionalize the word of God in the time of Jesus were the scribes and Pharisees. So we've looked at creeds and confessions. What's left? Well, now we need to look at Bibles. And we need to understand the people who run the big religious institutions and theological training camps and cemeteries are those people who have been making the popular translations. You have to pass their courses. That's how it works. They control the translations because they are the translation committees. In that case, every translation commissioned by, let's say, monarchs and wealthy monster publishers comes under their control. So it's going to be infested with tares. Why, if a word or phrase of the word of God does not conform to Reformed theology, if it does not uphold the teachings of Reformed theology, let's rephrase it so that it does. And that is what they do. So let's just have a look at some of the versions. We have to start asking questions. Two questions. One, who commissions them? And two, who were the translators? You know, we don't just pick up a Bible and not read the preface and just accept, oh, here's another version of the Word of God. How come there can be so many different versions? It doesn't make sense if they're all different and they're all the Word of God. That is illogical. And all but one of them must be in error, or maybe they are all in error. So, who commissions, who translates? The Bishop's Bible. Commissioner, the bishops. Translator, the bishops. The King James. Commissioner, a blaspheming, Christ-persecuting, occult-studying, louche Freemason with a male lover who had parades of boys brought before him every day. Translators, Christ-persecuting bishops and ambitious churchmen. And it freely adds words and takes words away, which is a crime against divine law. I thought altering a legal document is called fraud. How much worse to do that to the word of God? And the King Jimmy, the loose, loose King Jimmy version, destroys every major doctrine of the prophets and apostles and of Jesus, as I endlessly prove. The revised version, commissioners, two Masonic scripture-denying men suspected of being in the occult, Westcott and Hort. Com translators, they with a team working, a small team working in secret. It's expressed purpose by Westcott and Hort to rid the church of that vile text by which they meant the Textus Receptus, which is not vile. And they introduced Alexandrian texts. One of them, called the Sinaiticus, is now said by some textual scholars to be a tea-stained fraud. A German scholar called Tischendorf alleged that he found it in a waste bin in a monastery on Mount Sinai. I was always dubious about that, and if these textual scholars are right, my doubt is justified. And uh, Westcott and Hort openly said that you know they didn't believe the whole scriptures. Westcott wrote a book which I've got and have have read called the uh, Gospel of Resurrection. I think it's on my shelf up there somewhere, and uh, it's just about a restructuring of the Greek Empire. 
and Hort wrote a letter to somebody saying, I prefer the idea of a ransom paid to Satan. Yes, stunning. So, first of all, <laughs> it exposes that he believes in this mythical monster. And now, is this true? You might have heard or read about this before that he wrote this. Well, I can tell you, I have still got the plastic entry card I was posted from the British Museum allowing me to go in with a friend and research some documents about 25 years ago. And we handled that letter. So I have seen it and handled it. So yes, it is true. The New International Version commissioners and major publisher translators decorated academics and edited by a militant lesbian, the name of Virginia Mollencott. And a dreadful paraphrase based on the Alexandrian texts introduced by Westcott and Hort. So, if you are in any way spiritual, and I assume you are, otherwise I doubt very much you'd even be listening to more than a few minutes of this channel, you can tell with these books, these translations, that there, there's a deadness, a flatness, a dryness about them, a dustiness. And if the spirit was not in the translators, how can it come out of them? Well, it couldn't, and it didn't. You cannot get good figs from a bad fig tree. Now, that doesn't mean they all got everything wrong. Somebody, a few years ago, thought I was saying that in these translations they get every single word wrong. Well, uh, no, <laughs> and that would be very foolish. Uh, the problem is the mixture. And while they might get some good words here and there right, and might introduce some very good words, um, for example, the word foundation in the um, Louche King Jimmy version, yeah, I uphold that against some criticism before the foundation. Um, but then there are so many major words that they get wrong rang. This is the problem. It's not odd words here or there. It's all the major doctrines. All of them. That's the problem. And so concerning the Lush King Jimmy, they destroyed every major doctrine. As I endlessly prove. Now, there is a much healthier um, uh, atmosphere or um, questioning now among Christians. Um, you're questioning these books. That's probably why you're even bothering to t tune into part three. A small floodgate has opened. And uh, frankly, the um, COVID hoax in 2020 did not help the authorities and institutions because it suddenly caused an uprising of um, healthy-minded questioners. And so many more things uh, are being questioned about institutions. And uh, so we know that the Marxists say the slow march through the institutions, that's been their war. And well, I'm praying that they get a damn quick march out and more. So there is the healthy floodgate, praise God. And as for ourselves, we are not as the hoi polloi, making money by corrupting the word of God, but out of sincerity, out of God, before God, we make our speech in Christ. 2 Corinthians 2. So now we need to look at some test passages in these Bibles. Right, the opening of John's Gospel, so well known. Now, here's how it should be and what it's about. It's not complicated. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was towards, or pointing to God, and God was the Word. 
So John is playing with logos, giving different meanings. So in the beginning was the word because it came from God. God made his declaration to the patriarchs. And the word was towards God or pointing to God, not with, it's pros, and that is not with. The word was towards God, so the word declared by the prophets was pointing back to God, the very one who'd given it. And God was the word, or the oracle. God was the source of the word that the prophets were saying. This was in the beginning pointing to God. Everything through it arose. Everything arose through the word of God. And apart from it, there arose not even one thing that has arisen. Right, this is John's testimony that the events narrated in his gospel have arisen through the word of God. Therefore, it's his testimony that these things are true. And he testifies that at the end of his gospel, also adding that much more could be written and there would not be enough uh, books in the world to uh, narrate everything that had happened um, through the work of Jesus and his disciples. So, what happens with the Lush King Jimmy? They cunningly capitalised word, levering in the idea it's about Jesus being there in the beginning, echoing Genesis 1.1. So therefore Jesus has always been around and he, he must be therefore God. And all these versions think they have to follow. They've all gone capitalising word, even though they don't understand it. And so um, when it comes to verse 3, everything through it arose, they put um, all things were made by him. Well, the verb egeneto does not mean were made. Um, it's a stative verb for a start, and it so therefore it's also um, intransitive. It does not take an object, and it's singular and aorist. It is not plural, imperfect, passive, um, dynamic, and transitive. That's the linguistic analysis of were made, and it's none of those things. And so they have absolutely disobeyed the laws of grammar and pitchforked in what they wanted it to say to try and make out Christ is creator. Now it's rather entertaining in the French Bible that I have, La Santa Bible, it says, Au commencement était la parole, and la parole is the word, and so um, French words, uh, French nouns have genders, and so word, in this case declaration, the French word, that type of word, is a feminine gender, la, so it doesn't work trying to make it be about Jesus. But to try and compromise, they capitalized parole. So it's, it's just schizoid. And it doesn't work in the Spanish Bible either, because um, in Spanish, the word for word is la, is la palabra, la, also of feminine, gender. So it doesn't work to try and make it Jesus. Um, so that just appeals to my mischievous um, sense of humor that uh, they've tried to, you know, they've capitalized it. And... Uh, it just is complete nuts. So then, the wor work of the Louche King Jimmy version um, tries to make out that Jesus is God and the Creator. Well, so they've got the wrong God. They're dethroning God by saying that Jesus is the Creator because we know in the beginning Elohim created the heavens and the earth. God, he's the creator, not his son. So they've dethroned God from his creative act. And they have instituted instead a man to be the creator. The son of God. By fiddling the grammar. So they've got the wrong God and the wrong Jesus. 
Right, now what about the people of God? Ephesians 2.12 You were at that time without Christ, having been made alien from the citizenship of Israel. Okay, Paul was writing to dispersed Israelites in Ephesus. And he describes them as having been at one time without Christ, having been made alien from the citizenship of Israel. Now, that having been made alien, all right, four words, and it's from the, the Greek apolatrio, and it's perfect passive participle. Having been made alien, or having been divorced, is the meaning, the implication, um, having been booted out. In other words, they were, or their people, were at one time, part of the citizenship of Israel, but they are having been booted out. In other words, subject to that divorce certificate issued by the prophets Jeremiah and Hosea. Having been made alien, so Paul is writing to fellow Israelites, telling them now of the resurrection of Christ and that there's a new covenant. The enmity between Judah and Israel is over and uh, Christ is their peace. And so that's the people of God under new covenant. But what does the Lush King Jimmy version do? Oh no, that doesn't put having been made alien or anything like it. They put being aliens. Right, well, let's subject that to the knife of grammar. Being is a present continuous tense participle of the verb to be. Aliens is a plural noun. Neither of those things is in the Greek of Ephesians 2.12. Being aliens is made up, pitchforked in, levered in, and it implies that they had always been aliens because they are that G word that I hate, Gentiles. That always reminds me of a fisherman's slang for maggots, gentles. And you, if you've got a good dictionary, you'll find that. Gentles, maggots. I hate that word. It destroys the New Testament. The Revised Version that puts alienated from. Well, alienated is a verbal adjective and again implies the same as the Loosh King Jimmy. The New International, excluded. Another verbal adjective implying they were always of those um, who were not of Israel. The Schofield, the Scoffield Bible, the same as the Loosh King Jimmy. So they are disinheriting these Ephesian Israelites by implying that they are Gentiles. And then in Paul's other letters um, concerning Greeks, well, there's a very important verse in the New Testament, John 7.35. And if you want to understand this, this thing about this matter of the New Testament being all about the um, 12 tribes, just as the Old Covenant was, then you need to know John 7.35, Jesus' enemies say of him, is he about to go to the dispersion of the Greeks and teach the Greeks? The dispersion of the Greeks. And John 12.20 says there were some Greeks coming up to worship at the festival. This is talking about dispersed Israelites, the dispersion of the Greeks, and teach the Greeks. Now, why were Jesus' enemies so curious about this? Well, because the house of Judah had passed a law that it was forbidden to associate with any other tribe. Did I get that from history or make it up? No, it's in Acts chapter 10. The passage concerning Cornelius. So John 7.35, the dispersion of the Greeks. The Greeks were Israelites. And John 12.20, 
there were some Greeks coming up to worship at the festival. Now the Lush King Jimmy seven times changes Greeks to Gentiles. Can you believe how they had the nerve to do that? The word for Greeks, Hellenes, appears 27 times in the New Testament and seven times they changed it to Gentiles. Unbelievable! And so they changed it twice there at John 7.35 and five times in Paul's letters. So they introduced this phrase um, to the Jew and to the Gentile. Well, so the Jew, people take that, they think that means, you know, <laughs> stands for all the Israelites. But And they say things like, um, when the Jews came out of Egypt. Well, <laughs> no such thing is written in the word of God. That's an invention of the religion of man. The sons of Israel came out of Egypt and the house of Jacob. That's what it says in Exodus 19 verse 3. Tell the sons of Israel, say to the house of Jacob. And so when we have this word um, Yehudim and in the Greek um, Iudeos, pardon me, uh, meaning the, those of the house of Judah, it always means nothing else. It never refers to all 12 tribes. And so Paul says that the gospel went to the Judahites first and then to the Greeks. So, yes, of course, it started in the southern kingdom, the gospel, and then went out to the dispersion, the other ten tribes, obviously. You know, it didn't just go to the, fir the tribes of um, Judah and Benjamin with some priests of Levi and then just ignore the other tribes because the covenant is made with all of them. The days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And they were reconciled, as Paul explains in Ephesians 2. The enmity was broken down, the middle wall of partition. They'd even been at war with each other. But the two sticks described by the prophet Ezekiel in his chapter 37, or our chapter 37, and that beautiful picture of the mending of the two sticks, Israel and Judah. Well, that's what Ephesians 2 is about. So then, to try to make out that the gospel only went to Judah and then igno ignored the dispersed tribes, is absolutely stupid. But this is what the Lush King Jimmy version implies with its phrase Jews and Gentiles. It was to Judahites and to Greeks, to those of the southern kingdom and to those of the dispersed northern kingdom. Right, so they are disinheriting the twelve tribes. Interestingly, the revised version of Westcott and Hort didn't change um, uh, Greeks to Gentiles, but the New International Version does often, and so does the scoff-filled version. So this desire to change Greeks to Gentiles, is this some sort of racial persecution of the Twelve Tribes, wanting to disinherit them. In my book, The Study Companion to the Keys of the Kingdom Bible, there is a very long chapter about all this, and it's um, describing 12 words mistranslated in the Lush KJV of um, 12 words mistranslated that disguise the identity of the twelve tribes in the Word of God. So it's been quite a program. Now I don't think they were quite clever enough to do that um, all the way through. I don't think it was a deliberate design, but I do think when they changed Greeks to Gentiles it was. Oh, I hate saying <laughs> I hate saying that word. When they changed Greeks to maggots. And so the mistranslations 
help to disguise who the new covenant is really with. And well, what about Hebrews 8.8, 8, citing Jeremiah, a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah? Oh, well, they won't notice that, will they? No, and the strange thing is they don't. There it is in Hebrews, who the new covenant is with. And Jesus said of his blood, it's the blood of the new covenant shed for many. And that many is in Hebrews 8.8, 8, the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And that many is in Romans 1.16 and throughout Paul to the Judahite first and then to the Greek. So they have the wrong God who did not create anything after all. They've got the wrong Jesus who was God and did create what it says God created. And then they've got the wrong beneficiaries of the new covenant. They've got all the wrong people. Right, then there's this word Satan. I guess you knew this was coming up, didn't you? They have Jesus calling an apostle, Peter, Satan. So they call an apostle Satan. Absolutely stunning. Would Peter ever get over that if this real fictional monster existed and Jesus called him by that name? Because these versions have Satan with a capital S, assuming that you know who that means. Well, you know, one time, oh, 40 years ago maybe, I called round to see a friend, knocked on his door, he came came out and he said, oh, I'm just going to so-and-so, has got to take this book. Do you want to come for a walk? So I came and uh, walked down the garden path. His wife comes to the front door and says, calls out his name and says, don't be too long. He flicks his head round and says to her, all right, Satan. 40 years ago, I still remember that. I can hardly get over it. That he called his wife Satan. Unbelievable. No, Jesus did not call his good friend, his dear friend, Peter, whom he loved so much, by the name of a fictional monster. He just called him adversary. You're being an adversary to the will of God. Yes, I have got to be killed. But it's worse, these Bibles, they call God Satan. Oh, you don't believe me? 1 Chronicles 21 verse 1 An adversary stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. That's what it says. Who was that adversary? 2 Samuel 24 tells us it was Yahweh who was the adversary who provoked David to number Israel. But at 1 Chronicles 21, the Lush King Jimmy says, Satan stood up against Israel, but it was Yahweh. So they call Yahweh Satan. Oh. They call God Satan. They call an apostle Satan. They disguise also who the real enemy is in Revelation with their phrases Satan and the devil. Now there are two hostile forces mentioned in uh, Revelation. The two major hostile forces against um, the twelve tribes are the beast who was Nero and then the other hostile force uh, comes under various um, titles. The dragon, dracon, the ancient serpent, the accus false accuser and the adversary, and another one, the synagogue of the adversary, and another one, Gog and Magog, who I call synagogue and Magog. They're all, sorry, all one and the same. They're not six different entities. In Revelation 12 and Revelation 20, four of them are listed together. The dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the enemy and the false accuser. 
they're all one and the same. But by putting Satan with a capital S rather than adversary, the translators disguise who this enemy is and make out it some fictional monster in the sky with a pitchfork who's also, you know, busy down in hell stoking up the fires and uh, bundling people in, according to the mythology of Homer and uh, Italian poet Dante in his Divine Comedy, and according to Christian preachers who do not know the Word of God. But so in Revelation, we have to look for uh, the clues Piecing it, all, piecing it all together, well, who is this hostile force with these six different titles? And, well, we get the description in Revelation 2 and 3. The synagogue or the gathering of the adversary who says he is of Judah but is lying. And these were those Edomites at the time of the... Um, events of Revelation, the Herodian Edomites. Herod was an Edomite and his, and his line. Herod the Great, Herod Antipas, Herod Agrippa I, Herod Agrippa II. So that's who it is. But by putting Satan, it makes people think it's some fictional monster in the sky and with his pitchforks and his burning fires somewhere <laughs> underneath the, the earth. So, let's just recap. They've got the wrong God, the wrong Jesus, the wrong beneficiaries of the New Covenant, and they've got the wrong enemy in Revelation. It's not very good, is it? And then, of God and of Christ, they say that they torment people in fires for eternity. So they blaspheme the character of God and they blaspheme the character of Christ. Now if you were to ask me what is my favourite um, verse or passage in the entire word of God I would say Psalm 63 verse 4 Your loving kindness is better than life. That's my Yahweh and that's the Yahweh of the king whose painting you see on the door behind me, which is by the painter Honthorst. And that's King David and his harp. The harp being an Israelite instrument which you find on Irish beer glasses because the Israelites went to Wales and Ireland with their harps, praise the Lord. So they malign the character of God and Christ as well as vengeful and spiteful and bitter and that they never forgive. They malign the character. Incredible, isn't it? So the wrong God, the wrong Jesus, the wrong um, beneficiaries, uh, the wrong character of God and of Christ and wrong destinations of hell and going to heaven. Psalm 114, I think it is, says, the, how does it go? The, the heaven of the heavens belong to Elohim and the earth he has given to the sons of men. Blessed are the submissive, for they will inherit the land. Psalm 37, six times, and Matthew 5, 5. And they've also got the wrong uh, description of man and woman because they've got this implication of immortal soul. This is implied at John 11.26, Luke 23.43 and Philippians 1.23 which I have described in another video. And the immortality of the soul was actually the first big doctrine that for me to discover to be false. That was the first one. And so then it followed that hell can't be true. 
and as I think I said in another video, I was coming home on the uh, the choo-choo train from Berwick in Tweed on the England-Scotland border to my home in southern England and I was meditating on all these things that having been shown that the immortal soul is a fake teaching and I worked out then so is hell. Right, now it must be said there is an independent translation here or there which might be awake to one or two of these things. But none of them completely shakes itself free. You'll find elements of all of these in every single version, including privately translated versions, which are much better than the um, committee uh, versions. So all these pillars of Babylon, Six six pillars of Babylon, six pills, pellets of poison. They are an embarrassment, and this is what is rang with the churches. Every Bible I look at has its pages cracked and um, darkly shadowed from the writings, from the poison pens, and the, uh, what well, I was going to say, the lying pen of the scribes, Jeremiah 8.8, 8, and down under the poison trees of the Vulgate, the creeds, reform theology, and its confessions. Um, they have the order of the books rang as well. Jesus spoke of the law and the prophets and the Psalms. That's three divisions. So the Old Testament concludes not with Malachi, the Malachi papers, but with two chronicles and Judah being taken captive to Babylon and the king of Judah, uh, Zedekiah, having his sons killed in front of him and then his eyes gouged out. That's how it ends. And they've got the prophecies of <coughs> Ezekiel in the wrong order, as I have shown in a recent video, implying a future temple sacrifice system. So therefore denying Christ as being sacrificed once for all and wanting to restore the sacrifice by the blood of heifers and this is an abomination. It is not going to happen. God will not allow this. So they all bow down to the Babylonian inheritance of the three gods as one system, Satan and the devil, eternal torments in fire at the hands of God, ascending to heaven to live, which is not our home, and the immortality of the soul. The loose King Jimmy, the scoff filled, the NIV, which a friend calls the nearly inerrant version, ironically, of course, all complicit in altering the inheritance of the new covenant to um, the 12 tribes by altering it to Jew and Gentile. They've given it to another people who are not of the Twelve. So in Reformed theology confessions and the creeds before them, there's an arrogant spirit of self-assertion by their goons in Parliament, an aggressive spirit deeming it unlawful to act otherwise or think otherwise. And it all comes out. Well, before the 39 Articles, in 1519, in Coventry, a Christian woman and six Christian men were burned at the stake, burned alive for having the Ten Commandments and the Lord's Prayer in English and teaching them to their children. And the children were threatened with death for repeating what they'd learned. That was before the 39 Articles. After the 39 Articles, nearly a hundred years later, under Loosh King Jimmy, Christian men were thrown by him into filthy dungeons, and some men were hung, drawn and quartered. And he used his translators as inquisitors, torturing the minds of those whom he had imprisoned, and he arrested an 18-year-old boy. These were disgusting men, and the translators um, were used as inquisitors, well, some of them, including the 
chairman, Lancelot Andrews, and others. Um, I've got a list of names here. George Abbott, horrible man, Richard Bancroft, Hadrian Asaravia, William Hutchinson, John Overall, and would you know it, a Thomas Sparks, and Sparks spelt with an E. If he is a forbearer of mine, I hope I have set right all the evil that he has done. Right, the same aggressive spirit you will find in those of the KJV only cult. It is from them I receive the worst foul mouthed abuse and hatred, and they have held back the body of Christ. So to those men of position and influence and parliamentary association, decorated bishops and academics of the religion of the flesh, and those who oppress the wis wisdom of carpenters and fishermen and ploughboys, Paul says, he catches out the wise in their craftiness. And also, the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise that they are vain. So all these Bibles commissioned by wealthy monarchs and monster publishing houses, created by men squinting in dark shadows under the poison tree of reformed theology, have been produced to maintain the religion of the flesh. They regurgitate each other's blunders and blindness, blind leaders of the blind. Regurgitating each other's blunders, yes, literally, word for word, capitalised word for capitalised word. The spirit of reformed theology is in all of them. There's a bad spirit in them, and it's a very difficult demon to drive out, especially the Jacobean gobbledygook. Christians are reluctant to spew it out. Distasteful I find them, the popular Bibles. I smell the bad spirit in them. Now, William Tyndale and his friend John Rogers were different. There's spirit in those because they were true men of God. So guess what happened to them? Yes, burned and strangled. Well, strangled, then burned. These commercial Bibles, these Bibles are themselves false prophets. Never in their prefaces is it stated that their purposes are to restore the truths of the prophets and apostles, and their prefaces give them away. And in the preface to this, which you can find on uh, the website, um, I, um, in my preface, I've got a section on these prefaces. Well, the Lush King Jimmy version it worships Lush King Jimmy. <laughs> what a terrible man to worship. Um, um, flaunt yourself before. And as for the New International Version, it, its preface virtually admits its crap. It says it admits um, that it undoubtedly falls short of its goals. Well, why publish it then? Imagine doing a job for somebody and saying to them at the end that my work for you has fallen short of my goals. Well, I think they'd want their money back. But I, I can vouch to you, I can testify to you that the Keys of the Kingdom Bible is 10 billion lights brighter than my foundation goals in 1997 and 10,000 times more joy. The 39 articles excuses the, the unworthiness of these ministers. Well, I prefer the words of Jesus, depart away from me, I never knew you. If the Spirit was not in them, how could it come out of them? It couldn't and it didn't. You cannot gather good figs from bad fig trees. Now, there are so many wonderful old church buildings in my area within a 10-mile radius. I've um, counted about 80, and I've probably missed some. 
and some of them are a thousand years old and are humble little buildings where believers were going with their um, triumphs and woes and hymns have gone through those roof, roofs for a, a thousand years. Um, and there's a beauty in this, the history of them. But they're not proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and they do not even have Bibles in them. They have instead prayer books. So this is the word of man substituted for the word of God. And well, the people do, <laughs> heavens, the people do not even take Bibles to the services, do they? It's remarkable. Anything I ever run that you're going to come to, if you don't bring your Bible, you're going to wish you had. But I will have spares in the back of the car. So all denominations, all sects and groups, all the Christian cults are founded on these Reformed Theology Bibles rooted on the Vulgate, creeds, confessions, Reformed Theology. Their teachings are rooted in them. Yes, there is a group here or there who has corrected some things. Some know, for example, what is really behind the, the G word, the maggots word. They know really it should be Greeks and that they are dispersed Israelites. Some know those. Some know that the three God system is fake and that hell is fake. But nowhere near all of them. So, the house of Jacob, our twelve tribes, here perilous in our kingdom assigned to us by Christ, have not had for ourselves a Bible in English that makes clear the true teachings of the prophets and apostles and of our Saviour Jesus Christ. Nor have we had a Bible in English that makes clear who are the inheritors of the new covenant, nor the enemy in Revelation, nor the true nature of God and Christ and um, th their true character. They have the wrong God who divides himself up with two other gods, the wrong Jesus who is not human, the wrong angel of God who is yet another God, the wrong inheritors of the new covenant, the wrong enemy in Revelation. A complete realignment is needed. There is one God, the Creator, he pronounced through his prophet Moses, I will raise up a prophet from among you, a prophet like myself. And so Jesus, the Christ, born of a woman, Galatians 4, the carpenter's son, Mark somewhere. And there is a new covenant with the twelve tribes and the enemy in Revelation is not a monster in the sky, but is the Herodian Edomites who pretend they were of Judah and those people are still here. So of those scribes uh, of the church father tradition and reformed theology fathers, their orthodox word of God, well Paul says to them, there are many unruly and empty talkers and mind deluders, especially those of the circumcision whom it is needful to bring to silence, who overthrow entire households teaching things that it is not right to teach on account of shameful profit. Titus 1. And that's what's wrong with the churches. Their Bibles and their teachings have the roots in the church fathers and the reforming fathers. All of them. And from all all of them, therefore, there is here and there in their pages a bad spirit. They all bow down to reform theology. Next time, what am I doing about it? Thank you for listening. God bless you all and much love.